Dear friends, welcome to Who is Who in the Bible. It is a family prayer with the Redemptorists. Today we are looking at visit of the wise men at Epiphany. Magi, singular Magus, also called wise men, in Christian tradition, the noble pilgrims from the East who followed a miraculous guiding star to Bethlehem, where they paid homage to the infant Jesus as King of the Jews. Matthew 2, 1 to 12. Let us pause for a prayer. <coughs> God, our Father, we thank you for this moment of prayer. Help us to understand the great love you have shown us through sending your Son, Jesus, our Lord, to save us. Like Magi, wise men, we may worship him, offering him our very self. Dear friends, Matthew is the only gospel referring the arrival of Magi specifying that they bring three gifts, not necessarily the number of Magi that arrived, the importance of their arrival and gifts offered bring great meaning to the story. St. Matthew was a Jewish and possibly a Pharisee. The very next passage in the Gospel, after the report of the birth of Jesus, records the visit of the wise men to Bethlehem. The account is short and straightforward, but it does include a reference to an Old Testament prophecy which will be important in the interpretation. Lot of traditional teaching on the visit of the wise men puts the event a little later when Jesus was a year or so old probably because of Herod's desire to kill the children two years old and under. But we know that Herod died in the spring of 4 BC. And since the wise men come to Herod to find out where the king was to be born, the visit must have been shortly after the birth of Jesus. Herod probably set the age of two years old in order to be sure he killed the one who was to be king. Thinking that the wise men had been traveling for some time, so the sequence would be Jesus was born somewhere late 5 BC or early 5 BC, the wise men showed up in early spring and Herod the Great died shortly after have the children slaughtered. Christian theological tradition has always stressed that Gentiles as well as Jews came to worship Jesus an event celebrated in the Eastern Church at Christmas and in West at Epiphany, January 6. Eastern tradition sets the number of Magi at 12, but Western tradition sets their number at 3. It is clear enough to see that the story traces the quest of these magi to find 
the one who was born king of the Jews. They arrive in the palace, they receive directions, they are coached by the king, they visit Bethlehem, and they do homage to the child. What this all means will depend on understanding who the Magi were. But an initial guess would lead you to the idea that they were important people from the East who are acknowledging that Jesus is the promised King. The narrative then underscores the truth that Matthew is presenting, that Jesus is the promised Messiah, and that this truth was a real threat to the reigning king because he was evil, but a source of joy to the nations. But there is more here than a visit to a child who would be king someday. This Magi worshipped him. That was the intent of their coming. And so the narrative also reminds us that this child, Jesus, was far more than a future king. Only if he is divine could he be worshipped. But this makes us aware of the primary mover in the story, God. He is not specifically mentioned, but the presence is obvious. The star had guided the wise men to Bethlehem. The prophecy had recorded exactly where Messiah should be born, and the dream warned them to return home a different way. Without this divine intervention, they would never have come. The scribes would not have known where to send them if they had arrived, and they would certainly have fallen into Herod's trap without the warning. The supernatural element moving in the lives of the Magi is the true cause of their actions. As early as the third century, they were considered to be kings, probably interpreted as the fulfillment of prophecy in Psalm 72, 11, may all kings fall down before him. In about the 8th century, the names of this Magi, Bitsharia, Melikoyer, and Gatsapa appear in the chronicle known as the Exerpata Latina Barbieri. They have become known the most commonly as Balthasar, Melchior, and Gaspar or Casper. According to Western church tradition, Balthasar is often represented as a king of Arabia or sometimes Ethiopia, Melchior as a king of Persia, and Gaspar or Casper as a king of India. The three are often venerated as saints and martyrs, and their supposed relics were transferred from Constantinople, possibly in the late 5th century, to Milan, and then to Colonia Cathedral in the 12th century. They were some of the patron saints of travelers. So who were this Magi? We should say at the outset that the tradition that these men were three kings and that their names have been preserved for us has no foundation in biblical history at all. These were 
a priestly caste of very wise men from Mesopotamia, somewhere in the east, perhaps Persia or Babylonia. They were famous for their learning and for their wisdom. They were very interested in astronomy, astrology. When they observed the movements of stars and planets, they carefully recorded everything they saw. Anything out of the ordinary was taken by them to be some kind of an omen. Now, they had seen a star that could not be identified. These types of wise men were diligent to discover what signs some omens meant. And if they had recourse to the holy books of Israel, which they very well could have had in the East, since Babylon remained a center of Jewish studies. They might have come across the prophecy of Balaam, an early prophet from the East who had predicted that a star would march forth in Israel. Numbers 24, 17. It may be that they saw the phenomenon, searched their collections of books, talked to various scribes of the different religions, and learned that Israel was the place. If they had inquired about it further, they might have discovered that this one who was to be born would be special, worthy of worship. Then, when they came to Israel, where would they have gone looking for a king but to a palace? Herod the Great, who ruled from 37 BC to 4 BC, any study of Herod will immediately show that the man was a ruthless and paranoid tyrant. He would easily kill his own sons or one of his wives or the high priest if he thought any of these were in any way conspiring against him. And so the thought of a king being born was an immediate threat, especially if it was the promised Messiah, the King of the Jews. He himself trusted no one. So if you learn a little more about this character, you will appreciate more why he and his court were thrown into panic. We would probably say that it reveals the proper response to the revelation about Jesus in one of faith and worship. He does this by telling the story of the wise men who responded to whatever revelation God had given them by coming to look for Jesus. And when they found him, they worshipped him. Stars were believed to be signs from God, announcing important events. Thus, the brightness of the light to which kings were drawn was made visible in the star they followed. God made the good news of this birth known to them by a suitable sign, which guided guided their journey so that they might reach the house where they would find the one for whom they were looking. Jewish rabbis suggested that a star appeared in the sky at the birth of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses. Likewise, in the books of Numbers, the prophet Balaam speaks of a star that shall come out of Jacob. The story does not get into any major theological discussions. 
but about Jesus or about worship, but it does hint at all these things through their actions and through the prophecy of Micah and through the response of Herod. Well, in this story, we have Herod. He certainly represents the response of the unbeliever to the news of the coming of the Messiah. He wants to know about it, but is not interested to go four and a half miles to see for himself. But there are wise men, the focus of the story. The primary application would call for identification with these men. In other words, the way of faith looks for God's provision of a savior and finding it in Jesus, submits to him and worship him, even though it may not be clear how it will all work out. There are proofs texts to support the identification of the Magi with kings. For example, in the prophet Isaiah chapter 60, we read, Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Verse 6 says, They shall bring gold and frankincense. In Psalm 72, we find a prediction, the kings of Tarsus and Isles render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. But Matthew does not want these magi to be kings. To the contrary, Matthew does not favor earthly kings at all. Indeed, Matthew's Herod treats the Magi as servants, which is appropriate because the Magi were often viewed as servants in royal courts. However, Herod has no desire to do anything of the sort. Herod is interested solely in killing the potential rival. The New Testament writers the evangelists certainly knew not only how to teach, but how to entertain and draw people in. The Magi would have been considered by Matthew's audience likely to be figures not of wisdom, but foolishness. Magi are equated with Balaam, a figure who shows up in the book of Numbers. The only explicit reference to Magi in the Septuagint, where the word is actually used in the book of Daniel chapter 2, where Magi are summoned by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, not only to interpret his dream, but also to tell the king what he dreamt. Then, thank heaven for the prophet Daniel, who was able to tell the king what he wanted. Otherwise, the Magi would have been killed. But the point here is that the Magi cannot practice magic. At best, they were fools. The term wise men was first applied to the Magi by a man who was himself wise, the Venerable Bede, an 8th century British monk. But Matthew's readers would not have seen these figures as wise. Indeed, to inquire in Jerusalem where he who was being born king of the Jews, is at best politically known as Jude. Herod, who was called the king of the Jews, was on the throne, and his paranoia was legendary. 
The Magi show no acknowledge of this extremely well-known paranoia. Herod had at this point killed several of his children, his in-laws and others he felt were rival to his crown. And so the Magi also show no awareness of Herod's plot to kill his rival. If wise men means book-based wisdom, then Matthew is not in favor of it. As Jesus states in the Gospel of Matthew 11, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for hiding these things from the learned and the wise and revealing them to the simple. The important, the import of the Magi is not that they were kings and certainly not they were wise. To the contrary, they were figures of foolishness, they are figures of simplicity, and yet they, not Herod the Great in Jerusalem, and not Herod's wise men and counselors, the Magi get the point about the newborn king. According to the Bible, the wise men felt compelled by God and a new star in the sky to go to Jerusalem and bring gifts to the Son of God who was to be born. Gaspar, king of Sheba, brought frankincenses. Belshazzar, king of Egypt, brought Mira, and Melchior, king of Arabia, brought gold. There was not a fourth wise man. There is a story written like a fan fiction that includes a fourth wise man in the Gospel of Matthew, but it is purely fictional. They made an effort. This wise man traveling, however, many hundred miles to worship this new king was a bit of hassle for them. They must have had other things to do. But they let the Son of God interrupt their lives and call them to worship. We have got many calls on our times. How strongly does this call direct us? They came prepared. They came with gifts. They thought throughout what they were going to give when they got there. Did they understand the prophetic significance of what they gave? We do not know. But no doubt there was meaning for them in their worship and in their presenting of gifts. They were full of joy. The chance to meet with this newborn Christ really made their day. They were overjoyed. They would arrived now was the moment we can feel the anticipation, joy and celebration are a vital feature of worship. We should expect to experience joy when we are entering into worship. They saw the child. They could have left their presence at the door. But what they most wanted was to see the child. Worship would be easy if you could just turn up or do your bit. But true worship is an encounter with God. In true worship, we see Jesus. These wise men bowed down and worshipped. They knew what to do in the presence of a king. When we encounter God, like the Magi, like the elders in Revelation, 
like the priests in the first temple and like so many throughout the Bible, we being bowed down because he is God. These wise men opened their treasures. When we come to God, we open our treasures. What are our treasures? Money, time, talents, reputations. The Bible says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Those who open their treasures are those who have given God their hearts. Epiphany of the Lord is Jesus' manifestation not only to these three magi from the East, but it's also a symbolic but real manifestation of the Christ to the whole world. This Magi traveling from the foreign and non-Jewish nation reveal that Jesus came for all people and all are called to adore him. As we reflect on this Magi, Lord, we love you and adore you. We lay our life before you and surrender all you are our divine King and Savior, and our life is yours. Let us pray. God, our loving Father, you guided the path of Magi. Guide us in our spiritual journey to encounter our Lord, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, our Redeemer. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. God bless you.